gentlemen, boys and girls, a warm welcome to Oak with an area history group's first meeting in this new venue and my first ever talk on the history of Pantomime. It's great to see so many here tonight. A few practical points before we begin. For the safety of our children, the hall and changing rooms are out of bounds during the talk, unless a marshal directs you that way in emergency. In case of fire, the emergency exits are lit at each side. The toilets are through the door to the foyer and turn right down the passage. Photographs may be taken for personal use, but flash photography and video recording are not permitted. Please do not share photographs on any social media platforms without permission. And please ensure that your mobile phones are turned off. So now we invite you all to take in as much as you can during the talk and enjoy looking at the photographs afterwards. Please leave the cares of this world behind as you join me in bringing the nostalgic past memories back to life. Sit back and enjoy these. Starting with our pantomime introduction, which I'm sure most of you have heard many, many times over the years. So, how did pantomime come to be the form of entertainment it is today? What is it that attracts us, young and old, to this bizarre medley of fairy tale, dance, jokes, and so on? And how did it become part of the Christmas tradition? Well, first of all, I'm going to give a brief insight into the answer to those questions before moving on to talk about how drama and pantomime became such a huge part of the identity of this church and the local community, and why I think it is so successful. The story of pantomime is a tale of dragons and serpents. It pictures men dressed as women and young women masquerading as young men. Pantomime presents a tale of good and evil, where hope triumphs over adversity after danger and virtual despair. It has its roots in ancient Greece and actually came to Britain via Italy and France. Christmas, for a lot of us, would not be Christmas without pantomime. And pantomime was the place many of us first discovered the magic of theatre. So, how did pantomime work its way into British theatre? Think of the combined power of television and the internet and you start to understand the theatre's reach and influence of the 18th century. Thousands of people from aristoc aristocrats to apprentices patronised theatres in London every night. By mid-century, theatres were being built in towns and cities across Britain. Theatre was the place where everyone came to be entertained and many of the play plays that spectators enjoyed were stories about what it meant to be British. A rough and educated man called John Rich played a key role in the emergence of pantomime. Rich was a dancer, acrobat and mime artist and during the 1720s he was managing a theatre at Lincoln's Inn Fields. What he created was a new kind of entertainment. It combined a storyline from Ovid's Metamorphoses and a Harlequinade. This took the form of an energetic chase, featuring the adventures of Harlequin and Columbine, comedy servants of the time. Harlequin aids were tremendous fun to watch. Amazing transformations happened at the touch of Harlequin's magic wand, with mechanical serpents and flying vehicles. Rich also introduced animal roles, dragons, ostriches, dogs and camels. Pantomime has always been fascinated by the crossing of boundaries, the pleasurable ambiguity of men dressed up as women, and the fun of animals played by human beings. Janet was supposed to be coming tonight, and I've got a quick ear saying Janet just loves making animal costumes for our pantomime. <laughs> <laughs> Rich's spectacular performances attracted huge controversy. Critics bitterly attacked pantomimes complaining that this foreign entertainment threatened the downfall of Shakespeare and the death of serious theatre. David Garrick, the great 18th century actor-manager, was quick to join these critical blasts against his theatrical rival, but he also realised the commercial potential of this emerging form. But how could Garrick cash in on the craze and still maintain his position as the defender of legitimate theatre? 
His tactic was to set about changing pantomime's cultural identity, partly by limiting Drury Lane pantomimes to the Christmas season. Pantomimes became associated with the fun and frivolity of the holiday season rather than being denounced as a threat. In doing so, of course, Gary created a convention that has survived to this day. We now reach the end of the 18th century, the moment when the modern clown really arrives. Joseph Grimaldi, the inventor of pantomime's most famous gags, such as the butter slide where a character suddenly slips on the doorstep, or the sausages which suddenly come to life. Grimaldi, the singer of bizarre nonsense songs and the clown of urban life. Clowns and archaic activities including imprisoning policemen, tripping up old women, and constructing mock vehicles from cheeses and odd bits of furniture, not to mention stealing trays of tarts and consuming gigantic quantities of sausages. Audiences were thrilled by his mischief and his endless eating precisely because he created on stage the fantasy of a different world. A world without hunger. A world of comic revenge against the highly repressive government. Grimaldi became one of the greatest art satirists of his age. A clown who offered ludicrous commentaries on fashion, technology, new forms of transport, and political authority as well. By the end of the 19th century, Britain has become a major imperial power. Photography has arrived. The telegraph has just been invented, and the first motor cars are starting to appear on British streets. So how has pantomime changed? Well, the centre of comic gravity is certainly shifting, away from the clown and towards an unexpected star. A careworn mother, haggard and a bit of a gossip, struggling to cope in this unfriendly world. Pantomime crystallises around the story of a dysfunctional family and that strange, eccentric figure of the day. Dames had existed in pantomime before, but they were usually unbelievable, ridiculous characters. In the 1880s, Dan Leno started playing roles like the Queen in Humpty Dumpty, or Widow Tonky in Aladdin. Slowly, he began to domesticate the dame, and to imagine her as a mother facing problems which he and his audiences knew all too well. Poverty unemployment and abandonment. What he brought to the day was a talent for impersonating the absurd dilemmas of ordinary people, from waiters and railway guards to downtrodden women. What emerged was a lovelorn older woman facing adversity with a kind of desperate foe. The strange key to Leno's success and to the character of the day ever since was his creation of a credible woman whom everyone knows is being played by a man. The audience and the character comically share the knowledge that the dame is not really a woman, that the principal boy is not really a boy. Pantomime self-consciously disorganises the ordinary world and releases us to participate in its magic. Today, all across the UK, children and adults come to their local theatre to be dazzled and thrilled by the spectacle and the fun of pantomime. Billy Pierce has appeared in 21 pantomimes at the Bradford Alhambra and is still entertaining audiences at the age of 69. Keithley Musical Theatre Company, formerly Keithley Amateurs, owes the success of their pantomimes to Keith Marsden and Geoffrey Rundle, who joined them in 1942. They wrote almost all of their pantomime scripts and starred in them for many years as Dame and Sidekick. KMTC still uses their scripts, which are actually now performed nationwide. So what about Oakworth? How did pantomime become such a success story here? In years gone by, just as theatres became popular as entertainment centres in towns and cities, churches tended to be the centre of attraction for many community events in local villages. The stage in our old Sunday school hall, which used to be the opposite the co-op on Victoria Road, was used regularly for both homegrown entertainment and concert parties on Saturday evenings. The Sunday school anniversary always drew huge crowds to see the children performing at the services. There's a photo taken in, I think, 1959, and now I'm right at the bottom of the lighthouse in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> 
and my family came to Oakworth in 1957, two years before that. Uh, that was the year this, the old church on this side was pulled down. So I never actually came into the old church, but uh, my father was, was one of the trustees. So he briefly did the, the, the worship across the door. And, uh, when our new church opened here in 1960, that's this one on this side, and the old Sunday school building was closed, the entertainment continued on the low platform at the back of the church, where the lounge is now. We'll be talking about one or two of us tonight about the, the nine inch step at the back, which is where the Sunday school used to meet. And uh, glass screens came across in, in the front of it. Uh, that was where the campus is obviously it's, it's a church, which used to go all the way back to the screen, and the primary Sunday school met on the back there. So, uh, the entertainment continued on the lower platform at the back of the church with simple scenery and basic stage lighting added by some of the young people and their parents. I was one of those young people. I recall spending many happy hours here as a teenager during the 1960s with my good friend, friend Gregory Alden, who was on that previous picture at the last time then, making very basic stage lighting control boards out of discarded switches and two very squeaky metal slide dimmer racks that were donated to us. But any, any of you have come across the very old dimmer racks that used to squeak up and that they had to be right. <laughs> The photo shows the Sunday School Prize giving on the platform around 1970. Plus, our very first stage lights in that box at the top there. <laughs> it was during this time that my appetite for being involved in pantomime was first whetted. An Oakworth Methodist Junior Drama Group had been started for our teenage Sunday School and young teacher age group. And Kathleen Scatchard, whom some of you will remember, I'm sure, wrote a short pantomime called Cinderella Rockefeller for the group to perform. A few years later, Mrs. I. M. Jones, one of the uh, children's parents, wrote Cinderella 68, and the group put that on in December 1968. I still have the programme for that one. Tickets were two shillings, 10p and one money for adults, and a shilling, 5p for children. <laughs> See if any of you can remember any of these cast names from that pantomime. Andrea Jones was the producer's daughter. She was Cinderella, so short, Cinderella Shorter Cash. Buttons was updated to Zip Fastener for this one, played by Terry Milner. Barbara Newman was Sir Simon Shorter Cash. My sister Anne played Tina Shorter Cash, one of the other sisters. And her stage sister, Gloria Shorter Cash, was played by Caroline Stocks. Caroline's parents, Tom and Coralie, were well known in church figures and well known in the village as well. Lady Shorter Cash was played by Margaret Nixon, eventually to become Margaret Baxter and then Margaret Smith, no one with us sadly of course. And our principal boy and prince, uh, Richard Worth a lot, was played by Janice Leeming, now Janice Ewans, now we in Scotland of course, Janice in Sunday School, isn't it? Comics, Dan Dunnett and Maggie Muggins were played by Paula Milner and Linda Wilde. And Fairy Felicity was played by Anthea Tibbetts who was the daughter of our minister at the time, the Reverend Kenneth Tibbetts. Greg and I are listed under Stage Managers, Lighting and Curtains and Sound Effects. And, etc. and Sound Effects. I never actually performed on stage, always preferring to be behind the scenes. And that's done uh, everything. The platform we used doubled as a Sunday School classroom, as I just mentioned, until the growing Sunday School moved into new classrooms in 1974. The space was then converted into a permanent stage. And there it is for uh, our final festival in 1976. And we had improved scenery and lighting on that stage, which was used for over 20 years for a variety of events, particularly as we raised funds for church extensions. I said in the for our final festival in 1976, which was actually the Sunday School Bicentenary. We celebrated 200 years of Sunday School. Uh, and David Smith, who I mentioned already, uh, was still working for Bradford Met at the time, and he got all the flowers from Bradford Met for us. As the Sunday School grew, we put in our first pan Sunday School pantomime in 1979. Yeah, to kickstart the fundraising for the new hall that's now on the side, it wasn't there until that time. Uh, that was added three years later. It went so well that another ten annual pantomimes followed. Staging was not easy with only seven foot six headroom and a ten foot deep stage. But we managed, and it was all weather languages in the fire. So it was that our love affair with pantomime began. It was, of course, the previous year, in 1978, when the idea for the first pantomime was put forward and all the preparation work was done. I should perhaps mention that that was not the only love affair that year. It was also the year when Ruth and I were married. 
Yes, we had to juggle wedding preparations with pantomime preparations that year, and we've done something similar every year since. <laughs> Greg Eldon had moved away by this time, so it was the two Davids who headed up the team for the first two years. David Smith designed, built and painted all the scenery, whilst I produced the pantomimes and continued to play with the lighting. We're still using tree flats that David made and painted in the early 1980s, and you'll see some of them on the, uh, on the pictures as you look around. In fact, the forest backdrop that we had in this year's pantomime was that very backdrop that David painted in the tree flats in that same scene with David's trees. Apart from that, every year, all the years, I've just been explaining to one or two of you, uh, all the scenery just gets painted out each year and we start again each year. It's tragic really, but uh, we've no, nowhere to store sets for the number of things that we have, so uh, that's how we have to do it. Looking through the early programmes, we built up a formidable production team to train and guide those early cast members. And there were over 50 children in most of those early shows, aged from four-year-olds upwards. All were Sunday school scholars, chosen from the 100-plus children who came to Sunday school nearly every Sunday in the early 1980s. This photo shows just 70 of the scholars in 1984. Uh, we don't, the peak had already been... Uh, uh, been reached in the early 80s, but it was, it was slightly declining by then. But uh, that number came in to, to church every every week. Yeah. Uh, we saw a congregation of 20 sat on the back two rows, and the Sunday school filled all the rest. <laughs> the first first two into the service, and then they all disappeared their Sunday school sessions, leaving a, a vast <laughs> abyss. <laughs> Picture over here, and the congregation back there. <laughs> um, so yeah. Ruth Armstrong, Janet's eldest daughter, first appeared in the second pantomime in 1980, and that was when Janet first joined the team as a parent helper. She didn't actually make it into the programmes until 1984 when she became our front of house manageress, a post she still holds today, among many others, I should say. Interesting, interestingly, Janet's husband, Raymond, appeared in the programme in 1982 and 1983 when he joined the stage staff for two years. So we actually upstage Janet. <laughs> Not often. <laughs> Raymond was the only member of the stage staff not called Smith. He served with David, Bruce, Colin and Stephen Smith from three different Smith families. And the fourth Smith family was represented at that time by Christine Smith, who we've been talking about tonight, one of our choreographers at the time. And there were five Smith children in the cast that year as well. Rachel Dawson joined the cast in 1983, and her mother, Pat Dawson, your group, group chairman, I'm just going to say, I've got that wrong here, was drawn into the production team two years later. Mm. It's a small world, isn't it? <laughs> the very first pantomime we put on was Red Riding Hood. The title role was played by Adele Feather, youngest daughter of Alfred Margaret Feather, who used to live at Bronshaw House up the road for many years, I'm sure many of you remember them. <coughs> Granny Goodhart was played by Julie Hawksworth. Most of you will remember her as Julie Armstrong, which is what she became when she got married, first of all. Julie was only involved in the first two pantomimes of the first 11 year run, though the scene was sown for her to make a big comeback when the pantos restarted later. The show was so successful that we presented Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs the following year. This was Ruth Armstrong's debut year as Sunshine Sam, one of the Seven Dwarfs. We weren't allowed to call the dwarfs the names we know from the films because of the restrictions by Walt Disney. So we had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunshine. So <laughs> Adele took the title role again, and Julie played Queen Scarlet that year. But we were struggling to find a name. I don't quite recall how it happened, but my Ruth, my wife Ruth, somehow ended up playing Dame Natterwick, Snow White's nurse. Her one and only appearance on stage. <laughs> the following year she became prompter, a role she has performed almost every year since. Baron Week and Easy was played by Ian Gilchrist, Francis's son, for those of you who know the Gilchrist family. Aladdin followed in 1981 with Fiona McCallum in the title role, and Natasha Gaddis as Widow Twanky. Angela Smith, that's David's daughter we've been talking about, played the Grand Vizier. And Ruth Armstrong was a principal girl, Princess Baldrubador. Ruth, of course, now lives in Australia. <laughs> Next came Goldilocks and the Three Bears, with Natasha in the title role and Angela Smith in the dame role with Maria, Cook at the Castle. Sandra Baxter, 
Yeah, that's a lot to have talked about. Alison Shepherd and Kirsty Smith, Christine's daughter, play the three bears. Puss in Boots was the 1983 panto with Jodie Spur in the title role. Joanna Fish as Christopher and Ruth Armstrong as Princess once again. With her sisters Elizabeth and Rebecca, the fair ladies in waiting, so we've got a family all together. Rachel Dawson is one of the Martian students at the front there. <laughs> then came the first outing of Cinderella, with Ruth in the title role. Elizabeth as Prince Charming, Jodie and Joanna as the Ugly Sisters, and little Kirsty Smith as Buttons. You can just glimpse from Lisa Robinson, on the left hand side of the picture, you can see it once again, as anyway, as the fairy godmother. Lisa now lives in the USA. And this was the year my son Peter was born. Next came Jack and the Beanstalk, with Lisa in the title role this time, Jodie as Dame Trot, and Kirsty as Silly Billy. Sandra Baxter was King Satapon, and Lisa Berry played Princess Melanie, the principal girl. Lizzie and Rebecca played Giant and Mrs. Blunderbore. We've got Daisy from that very point of mind here. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty was the 1986 offering with Kirsty in the title role this time. Jodie as Dame and Emma Dyson as King. Maureen Dyson was mummy still one of our Sunday school helpers. She's been Sunday school, uh, one of Sunday school teachers for many years here. And she's one of our chief painters of the scenery, is, is Maureen too. That was Emma, her daughter. This was my first pan pantomime as, this, sorry, this was my final pantomime as producer at the time as I was working in Leeds and struggling to get home for rehearsals. And by 1987, my daughter Joy was on the way. Janet Armstrong agreed to take over as producer at that time. Janet's first pantomime was Sinbad the Sailor, with Zoe Spur in the title role, Donna Greenwood as Mrs. Semolina Sinbad, and Kirsty as Timbad the Tailor. This was the first year we put on four performances, Wednesday, Friday, and two shows on the Saturday, a matinee and an evening one. This Hickory Dickory Dock followed with Donna as Dame once more and Angela Baxter as Willy Winky. Mm -hmm. Lizzie, and Lizzie and Rebecca here are seen as slap and tickle. <laughs> My father been pantomime, had been pantomime photographer up to that year, but for some reason was unable to take the photographs this year, so that's why we, we don't have anything at this end, it's, we've run out. I think he was uh, working on towards his retirement by that time. Janet's final pantomime as producer was Dick Whittington, with Helen Rotherer in the title role. Her sister Louise played Alderman Fitzwarren. Julia Lanthorne was his daughter Alice. Elizabeth Varga, Sarah Suet, the cook. And Angela Baxter played Idol Jack. Rachel Dawson was Shake the Bottle. <laughs> and Andrew Dawson was the London Town Crier. <laughs> By 1989, Sunday school numbers were falling. The pantomime run came to an end. However, the new hall brought several community groups onto the premises and the stage continued to be used regularly in other ways. The stage was dismantled five years later as part of our 2000 scheme, an extensive project to refurbish the whole premises to make them more flexible and welcoming. Drama and concerts then moved to this end of the church on the new raised sanctuary. A large temporary stage was constructed, which I'm sure more than many of you have seen, which went over and in front of the sanctuary for special productions and was put away in the purpose-built freestanding drama store, which we used to be behind the church when not in use. Curtain tracks, backdrops and lighting rigs are all concealed, sealed above the semi demantable false ceiling and still there are those. And this provided us with much improved drama facilities, particularly when the stage is in place. To celebrate our new facilities, we put on another pantomime in 1998, this time drawing children from the community to take part. This was supposed to be just a one-off for fundraising for the uh, 2000 scheme, as it was now getting up drawing to its close. But this received such an enthusiastic response that the pantomime became an annual event, which still continues today. Mm. Sleeping Beauty was the first of the new pantomimes, with Sarah Jones in the title role. We originally cast one of the older boys as the dame, then he got cold feet and backed out. <laughs> Julie Armstrong agreed to stand in with her daughter Emma as Tickles the court jester. And the two of them continued as dame and sidekick for many years. My son Peter was fusspot the Lord Chamberlain and he can still recite his opening lines from memory. <laughs> tickles, Tickles, where else can the man be? Does anyone see Tickles? <laughs> no rights to be up in here. 
<laughs> My daughter Joy was one of the Spice Girls. So the whole family was now in old in our pantomimes. The photo is actually of the cast on a float in Oakworth Gale procession that summer because we don't have any photographs of the actual pantomime show that year. I'll run through the rest of the shows a little more quickly over here all night. Uh, Robinson Crusoe followed in 1999 with Deborah Smith in the title role, that's Margaret Baxter's daughter. Um, uh, Ma Peter was, uh, well it's, yes, it's right. Peter was Captain Perkins and Joy played the fairy. Joy played the fairy. Oh, yeah. The first panto I repeated was Aladdin in 2000, <coughs> though with a brand new script. And Kate Grimshaw was in the title role. <laughs> Meet Humphrey, the three humped camel created by Trevor, Trevor Olson. <laughs> this was Peter's final show on stage as Chow Mein, the Grand Vizier. He joined the lighting and sound team the following year. Snow White came next with Rebecca Olsen in the title role. Colours and Rainbows featured stronger that year. This was the first year we put on five performances, four evenings and a Saturday matinee. And every one of them was a sellout. So, the following year we took the bold step of doing five evening shows over a full week and matinees on both Saturdays, seven shows in all. Audience figures increased by 200 that year and we played to 1,050 people. Five full houses, one three quarters full and one half full. The year was 2002 when we put on the Humpty With resident comic Emma Armstrong in the title role. <laughs> Dick Whittington was the choice of 2003 with Diane Smith in the title role. My father made the ship's wheel, which you'll see over there at the back, and it's been used many times over the years since then. <coughs> Jack and the Beanstalk was our 25th anniversary panto in 2004 with Fiona Clough in the title role. Harry Potter featured, Harry Potter featured quite strongly this year, and the very popular Hogwarts Express steamed up and down the track several times during that show. And here it is on the floor. We haven't got the steam box in it today, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's been used many times. The train's been used on the number of pantos since then. And we also have Hedwig from that show over at the far end there, also out of the high water, of course. We held a big reunion that summer to celebrate our first 25 years of pantomime, complete with the wonderful celebration cake made by um, Susan, Susan Childs. Current cast members were joined by former cast men, members from all over the world. You can see Dorothy's, Robinson's daughter Lisa, right in the middle of the photograph there. Lisa flew over from the United States to be with us for the reunion. Uh, Ruth wasn't able to get back from, no, in fact, Ruth hadn't gone to Australia by then, she was still here, which is a lot uh, yeah. uh, She's now over there, though, of course. There were about 90 there altogether at that event. With all the photos out as we have tonight, and the, well, not quite as many as we have now, of course, because there's many shows, but uh, all these were out, certainly. And uh, snippets from the previous seven shows, using the original cast members and props such as the Hogwarts Express, were used in the evening cabaret at the reunion. A great night, a wonderful memories. Next came the first outing for Old Mother Hubbard, a Wild West pantomime adventure. She was in six months before we knew that we were actually to have a young American minister leading us for that year. Very few Americans know anything at all about pantomime, of course, and the Reverend Stacey Gearing was no different. <laughs> Nevertheless, she agreed to get fully involved in the panto and a bit to get to know our young people more quickly. So she was cast as Miss Lulabelle, the seductive leader of the Dancing Darlings, and she did a superb job. I think some of our older church members were not too sure about this young minister dancing on the, on the bar top. But <laughs> <laughs> she went really well. And she got to know the kids really well as well and, and was very popular with them. Julie Armstrong played Old Mother Hubbard for that one. This was her daughter Emma's final pantomime, thus ending a wonderful partnership of eight years on stage together for them. It was also my daughter Joy's final panto as the medicine behind the colourful UV mask, which you also at the back there. Jo actually made, created that mask and painted it herself. Um, and both, both the girls went to the university that summer, which is why they had to leave us on this thing. Red Riding Hood in, 19, in, in 2006 was our 20th pantomime, and it is probably the most complex set of them all, including a huge tank of water feeding a live waterfall and three fountains around the stage. And not a drip of water leaked onto the carpet below on the sanction, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> 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 
can they fly? Play the time for all in that one. That's the waterfall actually came up uh, in the box just behind the wolf's head there yeah. and cascaded it down into the sea. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the tiddly tree is the uh, big one there, which we, oh. um, again, that tree is still in the back room. We didn't use it this year, we used a different one, but uh, that is still there as well. We still have that one. So, uh, the ship's wheel came out again the following year for Simbad the Sailor with Sarah Shires in the title role this time and her sister Harriet as Bonty the Monkey. <laughs> Next came another new pantomime, Little Tommy Tucker, with Beth Olsen in the title role. She, this was to be Julie's last outing as our pantomime day. We chose another new title for our 2009 panto, Ali Barber and the Forty Thieves. It was the first time we did it and we'll be repeating that one next year of course if you know what, uh, what's happening. With Josh Foy in the title role and Rob Green as Al Rashid, evil leader of the Forty Thieves. Rob is now our pantomime electrician as you'll hear a little later. Francis Rothall took over the dame's role that year and did a very good job actually. Tim Bad's Teddy Treacle made his debut performance in that, in that pantomime. Look out for him again next February and there he is sat in the chair waiting for you. <laughs> Puss in Boots followed the next year with Judith's elder daughter, Sarah, in the title role. Sarah is actually now playing principal boy for Keekley Musical Theatre Company. So you can see how uh, we've been used for the training ground for a lot of uh, our young folk, which is uh, excellent. 2011 saw Fiona Taylor playing Cinderella, alongside Georgia Drake as Prince Charming, and Judith's younger daughter, Alice, and Natasha Rothall were the other sisters, and Harriet Shires played Button. Georgia took the title role in Robinson Crusoe the following year with Sarah as principal girl and Franz's sister Natasha took on the dame's role that year. Peter Kunis was an excellent gorilla. <laughs> Next came the third outing for Snow White, this time with Emily Moses taking the lead. Katie Workley as the prince and Alice Chapman playing the evil Queen Scarlet. Aladdin was the choice in 2014 with Alice in the title role Natasha as Widow Twanky and little Catherine Burbidgetta playing Boo, Aladdin's monkey. Georgina Lorriman was Princess Jasmine for that. <coughs> we weren't allowed to call the monkey Abu, but again, that's a copyrighted name with Walt Disney, so we shortened it to Boo. <laughs> <laughs> then came Humpty Dumpty, played by Elliot Green, with Hannah Wedge taking on the dame's role. And we still have the egg at the back there, we've used that again this year. Well, not this year, two years ago, but it has been used twice. And there's a mini Humpty Dumpty at the back, which Dorothy Wright actually admitted for us as a uh, publicity. Uh, yeah, I've done many years ago. 2016 saw so our 30th pantomime production with a brand new script, Hansel and Gretel. The title roles were shared by Hannah Woollett and Catherine Burbidgetta. And we finally managed to persuade a, a boy to play the dame that year. There is Harry Rundle, grandson of Keithley's most famous panto dame, Geoffrey Rundle, agreed to take on the role of Dame Dyspepsia Do Good, with Elliot and Hannah playing her zany children. Mm -hmm. Simple the Sailor set sail again the next year with Charlotte Harris in the title role and Emily Shepherd as her princess. And there's the ship's wheel again with the lifeboat, which you can see at the back there, and the mate's parrot is actually perched on the <laughs> far side there. Lucy Chester played Little Tommy Tucker in 2018 with Catherine Burbidgetta as the principal girl. And this was Harry's last year in his role as our dame. Old Mother Hubbard headed back to the Wild Wild West last year with Nathan Armstrong in the title role. Lucy and Hannah played her two sons with Scarlett Hale as her daughter, daughter and Scarlett, Mosey, uh, Scarlett Morris as Dandy the Wonder Dog. Shrunken head Horses and horses down there out of that one. They're not on those the, the pictures, but you'll find them in the photos. And the shrunken head of all over Hobbit is here. That doubles as the uh, the giant's head in some pantomimes, but obviously it's been painted. Last time it was painted was for all Mother Hubbard, and then we have a shrunken head appearing, or a, sh a shrunken version of Mother Hubbard appearing as part, as part of the the, uh, the plot. So that brings us right up to date with Little Red Riding Hood being our thirty fourth pantomime this year. Lauren Lortman took the title role as Rosie, with her sister Roxy, played by Scarlett Morris, and Lucy playing Granny. October Fox Grange played the Prince with his trusty axe. <laughs> and Peter Harris was Lupus Rex the Wolf. And 
we've also got Sammy Snake here from that show and the Rats, which are really love pick up for the bowl and the bakery scene. There is ones on there too. And we've got the magic number ball over the back there. <coughs> but I'm not going to stop there. You've learnt a little about the history of the pantomime and seen how it has grown to be such a huge influence in this church and village. But why is it so successful, I was asked to talk about tonight. Well, I think that's down to the very special team of people, both young and old, who make up our pantomime. And the fact that in spite of a lot of hard work and learning some very valuable lessons along the way, they all enjoy being here, supporting and encouraging each other, preparing these wonderful shows which get better every year. They all feel valued. They learn that the, the better they perform, the more they're appreciated, both backstage and by the audiences, of course. The more they smile at the audiences, the more the audiences enjoy the shows. They grow in confidence year and year and learn life skills which help to prepare them for whatever the future may hold for them. And that's why we, as the Abbott Panto team, do what we do. We're very proud of each and every one of the hundreds of children we've helped to train over the years. Since we started the Pantos again in 1998, Janet and I directed and produced the first few together until Judith Chapman joined the, pan the production team as choreographer in 2002 when daughter Sarah joined the cast. Judith, of course, had been involved in Keith Yamata's pantomime since being a child herself, so brought a wealth of experience to her role with us. Janice Grimshaw had been looking after the costumes until 2003, after which Janet took over and made that her main role, as Judith took more responsibility for directing the children. The three of us worked together for 18 years, each working to our own strengths, and with the rest of the pantomime team built the reputation of Oakley's pantomime into what it's become. Judith sadly moved on last October, and we wondered how on earth we were going to find someone capable of filling her shoes. <coughs> we needn't have worried, because Christine Aspinall readily agreed to step in and see what she could do to help. We very soon discovered that Christine had spent the first 20 years of her career in musical theatre on the West End stage in London, as well as two of the provinces. Moreover, as a very popular former teacher at Oakley's Primary School, many of the children already knew her and welcomed her enthusiastically into the team. Andrew Holdsworth took over as stage manager in 1998 when we restarted, with his wife Jane and Maureen Dyson in charge of scenery de design and painting. Dennis Whittaker joined the stage staff the following year when his daughter joined the cast, and Trevor Olsen joined the team in 2000 uh, when his daughters were beginning to be involved. All five are still in the same roles to this day. Other assistants have come and gone over the years. My nephew James took over as lighting director in 1998 and I moved over from lights to running the sound desk for the shows. My son Peter joined the cast as I've already mentioned for the first three shows and then decided he preferred to work back with, with, uh, with James and me on lights and sound. And he's never looked back. <laughs> Rob Green joined the cast in 2001 and continued on stage until 2010. Uh, so he went right through uh, until he was uh, 18 on, and, and he's acting on stage. And then uh, he was one of the ones that joined the stage staff when he left and started showing an interest in lighting design. He spent his spare time at that time at Bradford Alhambra, learning his trade, and in 1915 succeeded James as our Panto lighting director. 2015. Did I say 19? It's 2015, yes. 2015, yes. He succeeded James as our Panto lighting director, and you've seen in, in recent uh, Panto lines the skills that, Jim, uh, that, uh, that uh, Rob has brought to our pantomimes. We have a very talented and experienced adult panto team in place and we're well supported by many of the parents, particularly during panto weeks. You've seen some wonderful costumes on the, on the photos on the screen and around the photos. We have a, a selection of special props on display at the front which you've uh, all enjoyed over the years. And you've also seen some of the marvellous scenery our stage team construct and paint each year. I'm going to show you now some photos of just a few of the very special props and stage sets which wow the audiences each year. First of all, as I've already mentioned, we have the Hogwarts Express. Built and first used in our 20th pantomime in 2004, Jack and the Beanstalk, when the Harry Potter films were just becoming popular. 
it steamed up and down the track up the side here, which is where we first built the track for it, and across the top of the stage in, uh, well, in quite a few pantomimes as well since. And it's there on the stage today. As I've mentioned, I haven't put the smoke machine in to bring it to life here tonight. Perhaps, uh, we, uh, that would have involved actually hiring the smoke machine back in for the, uh, for the evening, and I didn't want to go that far. It's a very popular prop, as I'm sure many of you know. Many of our audience members look forward to seeing what special UV scene we have created for each year's show. The first of these was the Indian camp scene in Old Mother Hubbard in 2005. And the original medicine man's mask, which we've mentioned, is at the back there. Uh, that's the first UV main prop that you'll see right in the centre of the photograph there. Um, we use special paint which fluoresces in UV light for the UV scenes. Some fabrics also show up in the UV light, as you can see on there, but most fabrics simply show up black, or if the light coloured ones, sometimes they glow purple, which is the main colour of the, the UV lights, which is what makes the UV paints look even brighter. The following year in Red Riding Hood, this is the UV scene with the waterfall I've already mentioned behind the cast and the tiddly tree to the left. The UV lights are not on for this photo, but the vivid paint colours can still be seen. It was the real working water on the fountains which made that pantomime extra special, as I've mentioned already. In 2010, Puss in Boots, we had an underwater UV scene complete with some very colourful fish. But no real water this time. <laughs> the following year in Robinson Crusoe, the UV scene was inside the Temple of Bougar. I don't know how you pronounce that one. This is what it looked like with the ordinary stage lights on. The paint shows up quite well. But turn the UV lights on and the other lights off, and this is what you see. So that's the transformation between normal and UV light. Everything except the UV paint goes black with stunning results. One of my favourite scenes in all the pantos we've done is the cave scene in Aladdin with its high level walkway to the cave entrance at the front of the stage and pockets of coloured jewels, jewels which fit it up. So we have the walkway, the steps up to the cave entrance there, went through the cave entrance and it looked like you walked straight across around the back of the stage and straight around into the top where Aladdin is standing up there now. Uh, in actual fact you didn't, you couldn't because there was a stage uh, wings in between it. It's all an illusion but uh, that was uh, it, quite a popular illusion was that one. And, uh, one of my favourites. Um. In 2015 I wrote a Doctor Who UV scene into the Humpty Dumpty script. Why wouldn't you? Complete with the UV TARDIS, Daleks, Cyberman, and other Doctor Who enemies. This photo shows part of the scene in UV light, and the next one shows the same scene in, in UV light with red light added. <laughs> so you can see how the red light adds the uh, colours in the areas that were black in the previous photo. The last few years have seen some brilliant UV scenes. This is our 30th Panto in 2016. The land of forgotten toys down the magic well in Ansel and Gretel. The toys glowed really well in that one. <coughs> the voice is going. The following year I included a Paradise Valley UV scene on the island of Zalabar in Sinbad the Sailor. This is the panoramic view of the whole stage lit up in UV lights, so it's actually all the way around from here and from the other side. That's why it looks so small on the screen. That's actually the front wing and the side wings and the, uh, the back drop with the cave entrances and the back wall, and then down the right hand side and the front wings of the other side at the front there. So it's all the way around the stage, is that panoramic view. It's several photographs stitched together actually to make that one up. Um, So yes, panoramic view of the whole stage lit up in the UV lights with the cave at the back. It's difficult to see the detail on the small screen, but it's one of our scenery painters' favourite UV scenes, and there is a lot of detail. You can just make out that there's another bird and there's all sorts in there. It took, took an awful lot of work to build uh, to paint a scene like that. Uh, literally several weeks' work <laughs> in there uh, for our two main painters, and several other people helped. They sort of white out the uh, UV bits and then colour them, and other people and they colour them. The next photo shows a range of things. It is the 2018 UV scene in Little Tommy Tucker, in the main gallery of the Quaverly Museum. Shown in normal light, see the lights on at the top there. 
You can also see the Hogwarts Express peeping out of its tunnel up at the top there, that's one of the ones up at the top of the stage. And just a few of our vast array of stage lights hanging in the front up there, which hopefully are these, maybe those up there, that, uh, which is where they live now. Uh, unfortunately, the next photo hasn't come out too well in the UV lights, but it does show again the difference between the normal and the UV lights. My favourite UV scene of all time was from this year, in Little Red Riding Hood, in the woodland fairy grotto deep in the, in the forest. So that you can see the detail this time in the painting, I've not pasted them all together into a full panorama. So I've shown the individual five photos as we go around the stage. So the first one is the fairy grotto, which was at the front here, at this side. Next we have the side flats up the left hand side of the stage, with the owl and the birds on top, the squirrel and the rabbits down below, and the tree of course as well. Then we cross the stage to the side flats at the right hand side, which complemented it. And then of course we've got the heron and the ducks on the pond. And then we come forward to the tiddly tree scene, uh, the uh, at the far side there, uh, to the tree up the middle of the eye weave its way around it. Mm. And can you spot the uh, uh, owl and the squirrel and the rabbit in that picture? Mm. Squirrel over here, owl mm. perched on top of the tree yeah. up there, and the rabbit down at the bottom mm. there. And then the various birds and fruit on the tree and all sorts mm. in the monks as well. But the best bit is the centrepiece at the back oh. with the stunning waterfall to get to the scene. That was a, it was an idea that somebody had, I'd, I'd had the idea that we, we weren't having real water this year but we would, I still wanted a waterfall in the scene so I asked them just to paint a waterfall at the back and put the, you know, the lake at the bottom for it to pour down into and paint everything around it and somebody suggested well why don't we actually try and put and project a moving image of water onto the, onto the front of it and see what it looks like and I was amazed. Mm. So many people said to me where did the water go when you came <laughs> <laughs> from the water pulling as they were going out, you know? We couldn't believe that it wasn't real water coming down, it wasn't, it was just a project an image. Uh, the actual white bits you can see in there are painted onto the, the wall, so it's a, a black wall uh, where the water came down with uh, white streaks to show where the water was and, and then the image of the water falling on the front of it, which made the stunning results. And then they, also they painted the lake with the, white, with the squig with all the new lake paints at the bottom. Um, the actual light from the water uh, actually comes all the way right down to the bottom. You can't tell, can you? It looks like the waterfall stops there, but it doesn't. The actual image projects uh, you know, right down to the bottom there in front of everything. But the UV uh, light, it's, the UV paint is so strong that it covers it up. So, uh, yeah, that was brilliant. So, those seem to just one of the reasons. Our pantomimes are so popular. The main draw, of course, is our wonderful cast. We now have a cast of 40 enthusiastic young people. It varies between 36 to 42, but uh, on average 40. Aged 8 to 18. Now, we started off, as I said earlier on, with four-year-olds. There's no way we could have four-year-olds in the pantomimes when we do eight performances. So we're now limited to 8 to 18s. Putting on eight performances to over 1,300 people from the village and surrounding area during each February half term holiday. And of course the response is always brilliant. We also have a long waiting list of children waiting to join the cast. The next panto is always announced at the end of show week. All current cast members are guaranteed a place in the next show if they want it. So once you're in, you can stay in as long as you want to. If you leave, then obviously if you audition, if you do want to come back later. Many of them stay several years and some of them until they finish school. Audition workshops, workshops, audition workshops for the principals take place in April, May. The Newcast auditions follow in June to fill in the gaps and to bring in new junior children. A rehearsal start in October. Lines must be learnt by the end of Christmas holidays and the show is always presented during the February half term holidays. So that's the cycle of the pantomime. I start choosing it at Christmas and it's yeah, February the following year before we come to the end and I'm already starting the following year, we're going to have to be here after that. We then give them all a well-earned party at the end of March. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we can still give them the party at the end of March this year, but we may not be able to the way things are going. Mm -hmm. We'll see how we go. The standard of the full-length shows is high, and they now raise over £8,000 profit for the church each year. In actual fact, it's a big reason the church keeps going, is the, the pantomime. Mm -hmm. If the pantomime ever gave up, we'd be in Queer Street, I'm afraid. 
All the young people really work well together and it's so rewarding to witness them gaining life skills as they grow in confidence each year. As they progress, several of them audition for other shows in the local area and we regularly have up to ten of our current and previous cast in the Keithley Musical Theatre Company pantomimes and musicals performing to much larger audiences. We're so proud of them all. Mm -hmm. Twelve years ago, the Kids Keithley Youth Theatre Group were looking for a new venue for their productions and rehearsals. Since then, they've rehearsed weekly in our hall and put on three smaller shows for them in front of the in front of church with a cast of around 20 people. The kids group is the bottom picture in the cabaret photo there. A number of cabaret shows and other events have also been put on involving many of the community groups who use our premises. And there we've got pantomime cast uh, in the cabaret at the top there. And this is show kids at the bottom, which are now rehearsing on a Monday night with show kids that were in there. And Christine Aspinall runs show kids. That's where we found Christine from in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's one of the groups from uh, And, you know, if, if Christine choreographs something, you can see it's, it's got to be right. <laughs> <laughs> um, they are always popular. All these uh, uh, community group uh, are all the shows and uh, cabaret events and whatever else. Always popular with the audiences who come along to see them, especially if they include food. <laughs> Every year in June, around half of our cast come together to prepare a pantomime praise service for the church congregation on a Sunday morning. We use six song and dance routines after the previous pantomime and build a Christian theme around them to produce a worship service with modern songs accompanied by our praise band. It's good to see the young people in the congregation joining in together. Our minister and panto chaplain usually share in the preparation and this service too. That's one from uh, three years ago actually. But we did that again. Mm -hmm. All the groups who use our building work well together and have been involved in fundraising and grant seeking in the last few years to further improve drama facilities here. We're now the proud owners of radio mics with headsets for up to 24 cast members computer controlled lighting and sound desks and modern stage lighting and audiovisual equipment. We also hire in advanced lighting equipment for the large shows. Over the last few years, the church, with full support from the community, embarked on a very ambitious programme to add an annex to the rear of our premises to improve drama and community facilities in support of our mission work, particularly amongst our young people. We also moved the front door to the front of the building and extended the car park as well as making other internal improvements. I'm sure you're all aware of our mission possible project. <laughs> the total cost of this work currently stands at £478,500. The very good news is that we have already secured over £453,000 towards that budget. Over £118,000 of that has come from local donations and fundraising, which is truly a remarkable sum. However, we still need to raise a further £25,000 to repay the loan we've taken out to enable us to complete the building work last year. Donations are welcome at any time. The church is not being charging the history group for use of the church this evening, and so they're making a donation towards the Mission Possible project instead. After what you've heard this evening about the work we are doing with young people from the community, if anyone feels they would like to support further by donating to the appeal, there's a box by the door on your way out. It's not compulsory because obviously you've paid to come in already. That's it, the routine. I hope you've all enjoyed your time with us this evening and learnt a little more about the history of pantomime, the success story of Oakwood Methodist pantomime over the last 40 years, and the other drama work going on here. If you have any questions, I'll happily try to answer them. Do stay for refreshments, I assume we're still doing refreshments, and have a look at the photos, see if you can spot anybody you know. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
And I'm sure there were raised seats in here. That's right, it was. Obviously, we won't tell you everything on the raised seating now in there. It's, yes. the same, it's, it, it's the same decking we used for the raised seating as we did then. We've got a new, new frame under it now, but uh, yeah. it's the same decking we used for the raised seating. Yeah, the raised seating is here. And uh, I, I used to work on the scaffolding tower really? in the old sanctuary. Back there. <laughs> the old sanctuary took us up there. We yeah, fell yeah, high in the the yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the tray going <coughs> around in the as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it was still prompting. It had a bad back one year, goodness knows how we got that. <laughs> right, yeah. It was being dosed up just before that time, how we got all that. Right, oh. the, the show that year, David Smith came down and picked me up in his car, and uh, somehow they hiked me up into the scaffolding tower and started riding. I couldn't come out until afterwards because I couldn't get out. <laughs>